Have you ever heard a vet ask you, what do you think of this patient's biochemistry? Only for you to say, uh, those days are behind you because today we are going over the clinical biochemistry parameters that you have to read off of a patient's labs. Hey everyone, I'm Nick the Veterinary Guy and today I'm going to take you through this whole list of biochemical parameters you should know. Subscribe to this channel if you want to become a veterinary wizard and of course follow my Instagram at the veterinary guy to stay up to date and receive fun bits of daily veterinary information. Having said that, let's dive into the list. Starting with total protein, albumin, and globulin. Total protein is made up of the sum of albumin and globulin together. Albumin and globulin will often both be lowered, making the total protein lowered as a consequence of overhydration or blood loss. Any case where they will both be lost from the blood at the same amount. They can also both be lowered because of protein losing enteropathy of, or very severe skin disease which causes higher vascular permeability. And of course, effusive diseases like FIP in cats can also lower both of them because the proteins will collect in, for example, the abdominal cavity. If we only have lowered albumin, this can hint at liver disease because albumin is produced in the liver. And in this case, globulin can be at normal production levels because it's produced in lymphoid tissue. Low albumin can also be due to starvation, malabsorption diseases, or inflammation. If globulin is low, this is probably pointing towards some immunodeficiency. And if both of them are raised, then this is most likely due to dehydration, which is causing a relative increase of these plasma proteins. And PCV will also be increased if this is the case. Moving on to our next two values, urea and creatinine. These are going to be our very important and huge kidney parameters. And when both of them are raised, we can be pretty sure that there's some kidney disease going on. Uh, they have an interesting relationship with each other. So creatinine is really showing us how the glomerular filtration rate is performing. If GFR is very low, then creatinine is gonna go up. So if we see a heightened urea with a normal creatinine, then we know that the kidneys are actually working and there might be some other, perhaps a liver related cause of a high urea. Uh, if both are increased, we can be pretty sure there's renal azotemia present. And we always want to compare these values to the urine specific gravity to confirm that indeed the kidneys are concentrating and functional. So these two love to hang out together with urine specific gravity, which you're going to find in your urinalysis section of your lab report. Moving on to sodium. Sodium basically moves together with the water in the body. So when there's an altered sodium, it's usually due to an altered hydration status of our patient. Sodium can be high because of a low water intake or due to a loss of water where water is lost more than the electrolytes. This can be due to heat stroke, for example, or when the kidneys are unable to retain water, like in diabetes insipidus. Low sodium can be the consequence of a sodium deficit or of water retention, perhaps some kind of disease where there's edema present, like as a consequence of congestive heart failure, nephrotic syndrome, or some gastrointestinal losses or renal losses can also. Chloride generally moves together with sodium, so we want to first solve our sodium issues. If it is independently altered with sodium in the normal range, then we want to be thinking about the following things. If chloride is high, it's usually due to a water deficit, but it can also be the consequence of hypobicarbonatemia following GI or renal losses. Chloride can be low as a consequence of loop diuretics, or when we're losing a high amount of HCL, gastric HCL, due to vomiting or maybe some GI obstruction. Potassium is important because it can lead to life-threatening cardiac consequences. Potassium can be raised in case there's a decreased excretion, so maybe renal disease, and also an Addison's disease. Potassium can be lowered due to a low intake, but also because of losses in chronic kidney disease, and if we're using diabetics or we have a patient in diabetic ketoacidosis. Calcium might be lowered because our patient is in lactation or pregnant. They also might have a vitamin D deficiency, or they could even have pancreatitis, renal disease, or ethylene glycol toxicity. Hypercalcemia in itself can cause renal failure, so it's important to correct this ASAP. It could be caused by Addison's disease, hyperparathyroidism, or osteolytic lesions. Up next is phosphorus. This one often is altered together with calcium, in which case we want to first try to diagnose and solve our calcium problem. If phosphorus and calcium are both high, we want to be thinking about vitamin E toxicosis or hypoparathyroidism. But the most common cause of phosphorus being high independent of calcium is a decreased glomerular filtration rate. Low phosphorus, on the other hand, can be due to a hormonal imbalance or due to a lower renal 
reabsorption rate. If glucose is low, there's a lot of possible causes that we want to consider. We want to think about a possible hepatic failure, perhaps Addison's disease, neoplasia. We want to consider if our patient is pregnant or in lactation. It could also be sepsis, starvation, xylitol toxicosis, or of course, an insulin overdose. On the other hand, glucose can be raised as a consequence of several medications, most notably glucocorticoids, but also alpha-2 agonists. And it can be raised physiologically postprandial, so like after eating, and due to stress. It also can be raised in case of diabetes mellitus, neoplasia, or pancreatitis. Moving on to liver enzymes, this is one of my favorite subjects. ALT and AST both are used to measure hepatocyte injury. And ALT is present in the cytoplasm, and if it's raised, then we want to be thinking about hepatic injury. But it could also be due to muscle necrosis, so we want to check the creatine kinase concentration to confirm or not confirm if that might be the case. AST is present in the cytoplasm, but also in the mitochondria of liver cells. So when this one is raised, it is a bit of a stronger indication for a worse hepatic injury, but it can also signify muscle damage. And it can also be raised as a consequence of glucocorticoid or anticonvulsant treatment. ALKP stands for alkaline phosphatase, and this is present in the biliary cells. So it tends to be raised when we have biliary injury or cholestasis. But it's important to know it's also raised during bone growth. So in juvenile animals, juvenile patients, you would expect this to be raised naturally, physiologically. And keep in mind, it can be raised in case of a bone neoplasm due to bone growth. And it can also be raised as a consequence of glucocorticoid treatment or anticonvulsant treatment. GGT stands for gamma glutamyl transferase. This is also an indicator of cholestatic disease because it's present in the biliary tract. So when this is raised, we want to be thinking about cholestasis, biliary hyperplasia, or again, it can be raised as a consequence of glucocorticoid treatment. Bilirubin can be altered in three scenarios. There might be an increased red blood cell destruction. There might be decreased hepatic functioning tissue leading to decreased conjugation of bilirubin, so it's staying out in the plasma. It would be also raised in that case. Or it might be due to cholestasis, which is not allowing any of the bilirubin to be excreted, and that in that case, it would be lowered. Cholesterol and triglycerides are two other parameters that we want to judge together. And if they are both raised, we call this hyperlipidemia. And this might be physiologically after eating, but it can also be due to endocrine diseases, liver diseases, pancreatitis, sepsis, nephrotic syndrome, or even obesity. When they are lowered, we call this hypolipidemia. And this could be due to protein losing enteropathy, exocrine pancreatic insufficiency, and also due to liver failure, inflammatory bowel disease, or Addison's disease. Lastly on the list is creatine kinase. This is an indicator of muscle injury, so we expect this one to be raised in case there's skeletal, cardiac, or smooth muscle injury. Or in the case of cats, it is an indicator of muscle catabolism, and it would mean that our cat is anorexic because the muscle is being broken down. Reading lab values is incredibly complicated, and it's a skill that you really acquire through practicing it. So I have a bunch of other videos up where you can practice your lab diagnostics through working through an actual case. And of course, thank you so much for watching, and have a wonderful day.